The Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton Thomas Cole Four of my favorite pictures from childhood have been Cole's Voyage of Life. I have studied the tiny infant in the boat surrounded by roses, life stream full of luxuriant vegetation. The happy, ambitious youth, looking eagerly forward to the temple of fame, steering the boat himself, with no need of aid from his guardian angel. Then the worried and troubled man, his boat tossing and whirling among the broken trees and frightful storms that come to all. And lastly, perhaps most beautiful, the old man sailing peacefully into the ocean of eternity, the angel having returned to guide him, and the way to heaven being filled with celestial spirits. I have always hung these pictures near my writing table, and their lesson has been a helpful and inspiring one. No wonder that Thorwaldson, the great sculptor, said when he looked upon them in Rome, O oh, great artist, what beauty of conception! What an admirable arrangement of parts! What an accurate study of nature! What truth of detail! He told Cole that his work was entirely new and original, executed in a masterly manner, and he commended the harmony of color. These pictures are hung in thousands of homes, but how few persons know the history of the artist. Born in England, February 1st, 1801, the only son of a family of eight children, and the youngest but one, we find him when a mere child, in some print works, learning to engrave simple designs for calico. His father, a woolen manufacturer, had failed in business, and the family were thrown upon themselves for support. He was a kind and honest man, always hoping to succeed, but never succeeding, always trying new scenes to build up his fortune and never building it. Like other fathers, especially those who have been disappointed in life, he had hopes that his boy would accomplish more than himself. He wished to apprentice him to an attorney or to an iron manufacturer, but Thomas saw no pleasure in Blackstone or in handling ponderous iron. A boy of tender feelings, he found little companionship with his fellow operatives, most of whom were rough, and he enjoyed most an old Scotchman who could repeat ballads and tell of the beautiful hills and lakes of his native land. When he had leisure, he wandered with his sister Sarah into the surrounding country, and while she sang, he accompanied her with his flute. With little opportunity for school, he was a great reader, and when through with designs for calico for the day, he buried himself in books, especially about foreign countries, and in imagination clamored over high mountains and sailed over broad rivers. He talked much to the family of the wonders of the new world, and when he was 18, they all sailed for America. The father rented a little house and shop in Philadelphia and began to sell the small stock of dry goods which he had brought with him, while Thomas found work with a person who supplied woodcuts for printers. The father soon became dissatisfied with his prospects and moved his family to Steubenville, Ohio, where he hoped to find a land flowing with milk and honey. Thomas remained behind, working on some illustrations for Bunyan's Holy War, keeping up his spirits with his beloved flute going to Steubenville the next year, walking almost the entire way from Philadelphia. Here he worked in his father's small manufactory of paper hangings, yet he had longings to do some great work in the world, as he wandered alone in the wild and charming scenery. He loved music, architecture, and pictures, but he hardly dared breathe his aspirations, save in a few verses of poetry. How in that quiet home a boy should be born who had desires to win renown was a mystery. Nobody knows where the perilous but blessed gift of ambition comes. About this time, a portrait painter by the name of Steen came to the village. He took an interest in the poetic boy and loaned him an English illustrated work on painting. Thomas had already acquired some skill in drawing. Now his heart was on fire as he read about Raphael, Claude Lorraine, and Titian, and he resolved to make painting his life work. How little he knew of the obstacles before a poor artist. He set to work to make his own brushes, obtaining his colors from a chair maker. His easel and palette were made of his own crude manufacture. His father had serious misgivings for his son, but his mother encouraged him to persevere in whatever his genius seemed to lie. As a rule, women discover genius sooner than men, and good Mary Cole has seen that there was something uncommon in her boy. 
his brushes ready, putting his scanty wearing apparel and his flute in a green baize bag. Hung over his shoulder, the youth of twenty-one started for St. Clairsville, thirty miles distant, to begin a life as a painter. He broke through the ice in crossing a stream, and, wet to his breast, arrived at the town, only to find that a German had just been there, and had painted all the portraits which were desired. However, a saddler was found who was willing to be painted, and after five days of work, from morning till night, the young artist received a new saddle as pay. A military officer gave him an old silver watch for a portrait, and a dapper tradesman, a chain and key, which proved to be copper instead of gold. For some other work he received a pair of shoes and a dollar. All these, except the dollar, he was obliged to give to his landlord for board, the man being dissatisfied even with this bargain. From here Thomas walked one hundred miles to Zanesville, and to his great sorrow, found that the German had preceded him there also, and painted the tavern keeper and his family. The landlord intimated that a historical picture would be taken in payment for the young stranger's board. Accordingly, an impromptu studio was arranged. A few patrons came at long intervals, but it was soon evident that another field must be chosen. What, however, was young Cole's astonishment to find that the historical painting would not be received for board, and that if thirty-five dollars were not paid at once, he would be thrust into jail. Two or three acquaintances became surety for the debt to the unprincipled landlord, and the pale slender artist hastened toward Chillicothe with but a sixpence in his pocket. After walking for three days, seventy-five miles, he sat down under a tree by the roadside, well nigh discouraged in the hot August day, but when the tears gathered in his eyes, he took out his flute, and playing a lively air, his courage returned. He had two letters of introduction in his pocket, given him at Zanesville, and these he would present, whispering to himself that he must hold up his head like Michelangelo, as he offered them. The men who received them had little time or wish to aid the young man. A few persons sat for their portraits, and a few took lessons in drawing. But after a time, he had no money to pay for washing his linen, and at last, no linen even to be washed. Still enthusiastic over art, and with visions of Italy floating in his mind, yet penniless and footsore, he returned to Steubenville to tell his sorrows to his sympathetic mother. How her heart must have been moved as she looked upon her boy's pale face and great blue eyes, and felt his eager desire for a place of honor in the world, but knew, alas, that she was powerless to aid him. He took a plain room for a studio, painted some scenes for a society of amateur actors, and commenced two pictures, Ruth gleaning in the field of Boaz, and the feast of Belshazzar. One Sunday, some vicious boys broke into the studio, mixed the paints, broke the brushes, and cut the paintings in pieces. Learning that the boys were poor, Cole could not bear to prosecute them, and the matter was dropped. He soon departed to Pittsburgh, whither his parents had moved, and began to assist his father in making floor cloths. Every moment of leisure, he was down by the banks of the Monongahela, carefully drawing tree, or cloud, or hilltop. Finally the longings became irresistible. He packed his little trunk. His mother threw over his shoulders the tablecloth, with her blessing and her tears, and with six dollars in his purse, he said goodbye to the family and started for Philadelphia. Then followed, as he used to say in after years, the winter of his discontent. In a poor quarter of the city, in an upper room, without a bed or fire or furniture, struggled poor Thomas Cole. Timid, friendless, his only food, a baker's roll and a pitcher of water, his only bedding at night, the tablecloth. He worked day by day, now copying in the academy, and now ornamenting bellows, brushes, or Japan ware, with figures of birds or with flowers. Sometimes he ran down a neighboring alley, whipping his hands about him to keep his blood in circulation, lest he be benumbed. He soon became the victim of inflammatory rheumatism, and was a great sufferer. He still saw before him, some way, somehow, renown. Meantime, his pure, noble soul found solace in writing poetry and an occasional story for the Saturday Evening Post. After a year and a half, he put his goods on a wheelbarrow. 
had them carried to the station and started for New York, whither his family had moved. He was now twenty-four. Life had been one continuous struggle. Still he loved each beauty in nature and hoped for the good time to come. In his father's garret in Greenwich Street, in a room so narrow that he could scarcely work, and so poorly lighted that he was, perpetually fighting a kind of twilight, he labored for two years. Obstacles seemed but to increase his determination to persevere. Oh, such grand material our heroes made. His first five pictures were placed for exhibition in the shop of an acquaintance and were sold at eight dollars apiece. Through the courtesy of a gentleman who purchased three of these, he was enabled to go up the Hudson and sketch from nature among the Catskills. This was indeed a great blessing. On his return, he painted a view of Fort Putnam, Lake with Dead Trees, and the Falls of the Catterskills. These were purchased for $25 apiece by three artists, Trumbull, Dunlap, and Durand. Trumbull first discovered the merits of the pictures, buying the falls for his studio, and invited Cole to meet Durand at his rooms. At the hour appointed, the sensitive artist made his appearance, so timid that at first he could only reply to their cordial questioning by monosyllables. Colonel Trumbull said, You surprise me at your age to paint like this. You have already done what I, with all my years and experience, am yet unable to do. Through the new friends, attention was called to his work, and he soon had abundant commissions. How his hungry heart must have fed on this appreciation. From that time, says his friend, William Cullen Bryant, he had a fixed reputation and was numbered among the men of whom our country had reason to be proud. I well remember what an enthusiasm was awakened by these early works of his. The delight which was expressed at the opportunity of contemplating pictures, which carried the eye over scenes of wild grandeur, peculiar to our country, over our arid mountain tops, with their mighty growth of forest, never touched by the axe, along the banks of streams, never deformed by culture, and into the depth of skies, bright with the hues of our own climate, such skies as few but coal could ever paint, and through the transparent abysses of which it seemed that you might send an arrow out of sight. The struggles were not all over, but the renown of which the calico designer had dreamed had actually come. Down in the heart of Mary Cole, there must have been deep thanksgiving that she had urged him on. He, with a few others, now founded the National Academy of Design. He took lodgings in the Catskills in the summer of 1826 and worked diligently. He studied nature like a lover. Now he sketched a peculiar sunset, now a wild storm, now an exquisite waterfall. Why do not the younger landscape painters walk, walk alone and endlessly, he used to say. How I have walked, day after day, and all alone, to see if there was not something among the old things which was new. He knew every chasm, every velvety bank, every dainty flower growing in some tanglewood for miles around. American scenery, with its untamed wilderness, lake and mountain, was his chief passion. He found no pleasure, however, in hunting or fishing, for his kind heart could not bear to inflict the slightest injury. The following spring, he exhibited at the National Academy the Garden of Eden and the Expulsion, rich in poetic conception, and in the fall, sketched in the White Mountains, especially near North Conway, which the lamented Star King loved so well. In the winter he was very happy, finishing his Chorcorua Peak. A visitor said, Your clouds, sir, appear to move. That, replied the artist, is precisely the effect I desire. He was now eager to visit Europe to study art, but first he must see Niagara, of which he made several sketches. He had learned the secret that all poets and artists finally learn, that they must identify themselves with some great event in history, something grand in nature, or some immortal name. Milton chose a sublime subject, Homer a great war, just as someone will make our civil war a famous epic two centuries hence. In June 1829, he sailed for Europe, and there, for two years, studied faithfully. In London, he saw much of Turner, of whom he said, I consider him as one of the greatest landscape painters that ever lived, and his temple of Jupiter as fine as anything the world has produced. 
In landscapes, my favorites are Claude Lorraine and Gaspar Poussin. Some of Cole's work was exhibited at the British Gallery, but the autumn coloring was generally condemned as false to nature. How little we know about what we have not seen. Paris he enjoyed greatly for its clear skies and sunny weather, essentials usually to those of poetic temperament, though he was not overly pleased with the Venuses and psyches of modern French art. For nine months he found the galleries of Florence a paradise to a painter. He thought our skies more gorgeous than the Italian, though theirs have a peculiar softness and beauty. At Rome, some of his friends said, Cole works like a crazy man. He usually rose at five o'clock, worked till noon, taking an hour for eating and rest, and then sketched again till night. There was a reason for this. The support of the family came upon him, besides the payment of debts incurred by his father. He felt that every hour was precious. In Rome, he found the Pantheon simple and grand, the Apollo Belvedere the most perfect of human productions, while the Venus de Medici has the excellence of feminine form, destitute in a great measure of intellectual expression, the transfiguration, beautiful in color and chiaroscuro, and Michelangelo's Moses, one of the things never to be forgotten. On his return to New York, he took rooms at the corner of Wall Street and Broadway. Here he won the friendship of Lumen Reed, for whom he promised to paint pictures for one room, to cost $5,000. The chief pictures for Mr. Reed, who died before their completion, were five, called The Course of Empire, representing man in different phases of savage life, high civilization, and ruin through sin, the idea coming to him while in Rome. Of this group, Cooper, the novelist, said, I consider The Course of Empire the work of the highest genius this country has ever produced, and one of the noblest works of art that has ever been wrought. In November 1836, Mr. Cole was married to Maria Bartow, a young lady of refinement and loveliness of character. Soon after, both his parents died. The departure and return were now painted, among his noblest works, says Bryant, followed by the voyage of life for Mr. Samuel Ward, who, like Mr. Reed, died before the set was finished. This series was sold in 1876 for $3,100. These pictures he had worked upon with great care and intensity. He used to say, Genius was but one wing, and, unless sustained on the other side, by the well-regulated wing of assiduity, will quickly fall to the ground. The artist must work always. His eye and mind can work even when his pen is idle. He must, like a musician, draw a circle round him and exclude all intrusive spirits. And above all, if he would attain that serene atmosphere of mind in which float the highest conceptions of the soul, in which the sublimest works have been produced, he must be possessed of a holy and reasonable faith. The voyage of life was well received. The engraver, Mr. Smiley, found one morning before the second of the series, youth, a person in middle life looking as though in deep thought. Sir, he said at length, I am a stranger in the city and in great trouble of mind, but the sight of these pictures has done me great good. I go away from this place quieted and much strengthened to do my duty. In 1841, worn in health, Cole determined to visit Europe again. He wrote from Kenilworth Castle to his wife, Every flower and mass of ivy, every picturesque effect, waken my regret that you were not by my side. How can I paint without you to praise or to criticize, and little Teddy to come for Papa to go to dinner, and little Mary with her black eyes to come and kiss the figures in the pictures? My life will be burdened with sadness until I return to my wife and family. In Rome, he received much attention, as befitted one in his position. On his return, he painted several European scenes, the Roman Campania, angels ministering to Christ in the wilderness, Mountain Ford, sold in 1876 for $900, The Good Shepherd, Hunter's Return, Mill at Sunset, and many others. For his Mount Etna, painted in five days, he received $500. How different these days from that pitiful winter in Philadelphia. He dreaded interruptions in his work. His St. John the Baptist in the Wilderness was destroyed by an unexpected visit from some ladies and gentlemen who quenched the fire of heart in which he was working. 
He sorrowfully turned the canvas to the wall and never finished it. He had now come to the zenith of his power, yet he modestly said, I have only learned how to paint. He built a new studio in the Catskills, in the Italian villa style, and hoped to erect a gallery for several paintings he had in contemplation, illustrating the cross and the world, and the immortality of the soul. But the overworked body at 47 years of age could no longer bear the strain. On Saturday, February 5, 1848, he laid his colors under water and cleansed his palate as he left his studio. The next day, he was seized with inflammation of the lungs. The following Friday, after the communion service at his bedside, he said, I want to be quiet. These were his last words. The tired artist had finished his work. The voyage of life was over. He had won enduring fame.